Today in our Bible study, I want to help you in understanding uh, something in Bible prophecy that is significant and there is oftentimes much teaching on the Antichrist. But today in our Bible study, I want to teach on the subject of how to recognize the coming final false prophet. And in our Bible study, I'm going to show you eight specific biblical ways that the author of Revelation gave to us to clearly identify this final false prophet. And if you're a believer, you'll never meet the false prophet. But I think many of you in hearing the Bible study today, it will help you to better understand the direction that modern politics are moving in and the globalistic mindset and the one world ideology and etc. This is a very important Bible study on the subject of Bible prophecy on the false prophet. And let's begin in Revelation 13 if you have your Bible. And again, we're going to just walk right down through uh, the verses that I'm going to read and we're going to discover eight ways to recognize the final false prophet. Revelation chapter 13, beginning to read at verse 11, and I'm reading today out of the New Living Translation. The Bible said, Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived. I always, when I teach on Bible prophecy, ask all of our students, keep a highlighter handy. But I often ask you, the word deceived, deceived, deception in Bible prophecy, every time you see it, every time you read it, run a highlighter through it to help you better understand the importance of solid biblical teaching that protects us from the growing end time deception. He deceived all the people who belong to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Pause right there. In this Bible study today, I am going to show you some technology I just discovered in the last 48 hours. It is a company that is making what they call the giant, might even be the name of the company, but it is a statue that is over five stories tall and they're utilizing artificial intelligence, LED lights, and so forth. But they have said they will be debuting a statue. You're going to see a picture a little later of this. I'll come back to it. But that moves and speaks, and the technology that is fulfilling Bible prophecy should have every student of the Bible's full attention. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. Verse 16, he required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. As I always do, let me pray with you today before we begin. 
Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the sacred scriptures, we are so grateful for the content of Bible prophecy that provides for us a roadmap so that we might successfully navigate the last days in which we live. There is no need for fear or anxiety or concern because there is a divine protection available to every child of God living in right relationship with Jesus Christ, your only Son. So now I pray specifically for those who may be listening. Maybe they once knew you, but through some set of circumstances in life, they've wandered away or their senses have been dulled. They're backslidden away from Christ. And for those perhaps who have never had anyone that loved them enough to carefully explain to them how they can have a right relationship with God, help me today to speak to them and to be gracious to them and to be clear in how we have right relationship with God in these last days. And now by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, guide us into truth. And for all things, we'll be careful to give you praise. For we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, uh, Amen. Uh, I want you to keep your Bible open to uh, the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation today because I'm literally going, you've always heard me say, we should start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. Well, today is going to be a thorough example of that because we're literally going to go verse by verse by verse. And I want to, and if you're taking notes, I hope you're ready to take notes, I want you to have these eight ways of recognizing this coming final false prophet. Because in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, we are introduced to two nefarious world leaders who will appear on the world stage shortly after the rapture of the church. Now, if you're a new student to our ministry and to our channel, uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. There is a tremendous amount of content on our channel that deals with Bible prophecy. Probably more than half of our content focuses upon eschatology, the end times, and the last days. And if you're not familiar with the term rapture, then there are several videos that will help you. There are many people today who are saying, and not accurately, that there is no rapture. There is a rapture. It is the next major prophetic event on the calendar of God, and we need to live ready every day. Revelation 13 describes these two blasphemous men as the first beast followed by the second beast. The first beast, if you're taking notes, and we'll come back to this, refers to the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the first beast mentioned in the book of Revelation. But he's followed by what the scripture calls the second beast, and the second beast is his colleague in the puppetry of Satanic's final plan called the false prophet. And many eschatology scholars have stated that both the Antichrist and the false prophet are described by John. John is the author of the book of Revelation. That John picked the word beasts to warn the readers of these global nefarious leaders and how savage and inhumane their nature is going to be. Revelation 13 is also a very climatic chapter because it's the first time, don't miss this, you've Heard me teach this before, but it is so extremely important, I repeat it often. Revelation 13 is one of the most climatic chapters in the entirety of the Bible because it is the very first time in all of the Bible that we are introduced to. The curtain is pulled back 
and we are introduced to what is oftentimes called the unholy trinity and their individual roles. The three members of the unholy trinity, the Bible in the book of Revelation, introduces the dragon. And we know from the scripture that the dragon refers uh, to Satan. And somebody asked me one time in my preaching, well, is that your interpretation or, you know, is it literal? Is there going to be a real dragon? No. Uh, we know that the dragon referred to in Revelation 13 is Satan. Well, how do we know that? Well, just turn back one chapter. Just turn there to Revelation 12 and highlight verse 9. Revelation 12, verse 9. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world. And there's that word uh, deceiving again. Another quick reminder, if you're studying Bible prophecy, highlight the word deceive, deceived, and deception. It will be of great help to you in understanding the complexity of the hour in which we live, not only in the world, but the deception that exists in the church. The second member of the unholy trinity is the Antichrist. The dragon is Satan. The first beast is the Antichrist, who is described as rising up out of the sea. Many eschatology scholars uh, say that the author using the sea, that uh, culturally in that time the sea was almost synonymous in referring uh, to the nations and that the Antichrist rising up out of the sea means that the Antichrist is going to be revealed coming out of the nations. And then the third member of the unholy trinity, which is the focus of our Bible study today, is the false prophet. And he is described as coming up out of the earth. And I'll come back to that. But with that laid as a foundation, get your tablets or your digital tablets and pen and pencil ready, and let's focus on eight ways to recognize the coming final false prophet. Straight out of the pages of the Bible, God, through the author John, gives us eight ways of recognizing clearly the coming final false prophet. Now, many people have asked me through uh, my four, almost five decades of ministry, do you think we will recognize the Antichrist before the rapture? Well, I personally believe, and I have uh, a teaching on the Antichrist on our channel that will be of, of great depth to you, but I believe the possibility exists of recognizing the Antichrist and as I share with you in our study today, the eight ways of recognizing the final false prophet, I believe, this is my opinion based on scripture, I believe there is a distinct possibility to those who know the Bible, who take time to go into the depths of what we're teaching today, and we mine like gold out of the scriptures, the definition of the false prophet, the definition of the Antichrist, and so on, I believe there's a possibility that both could be alive and well on the earth today, especially an argument made for the Antichrist already being in a position, either politically or religiously or economically, somewhere in the world, but hidden from view at this current time. Let's begin. Eight ways, if you're taking notes, just write this down. Eight ways to recognize the coming final false prophet. Eight ways to recognize the coming final false prophet. Number one, the Bible tells us that the final false prophet will arise up out of the earth. Now, I gave to you just a brief explanation as to what scholars say concerning the Antichrist coming up out of the seas, the nations, 
But what does it mean in Revelation 13 and verse 11 when it says the final prophet will arise out of the earth? Look at verse 11. Revelation uh, 13. Let's go back there. Revelation 13 verse 11. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. You can run your highlighter through that. Come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. Those two horns, a, a lamb uh, has, a male has two uh, horns, and he may appear. It seems like the author is, is giving us a, a clue that the false prophet is going to appear perhaps like a lamb, meek and lowly and winsome and charming. But the Bible says that his message will be the message of Satan. And that's an important spiritual principle to understand. Not everybody in your life that looks like a lamb, acts like a lamb, and is loving like a lamb is your best friend. It is what is in a man's heart or a woman's heart that defines their true character. And some scholars believe when the scripture, John, the author of the book of Revelation, describes the false prophet as coming up out of the earth, there are many eschatology scholars, trusted scholars, not all, but many who believe that this could be a definition that Satan, who is the puppet master of the unholy trinity, is going to bring him up out of the pits of hell, that he may very well be a demonic power that is groomed to perhaps possess a human body. We're not going to get in all of the discussion of that, but just so you'll understand, there are many trusted scholars who believe that the Bible saying he will come up out of the earth, that Satan has groomed a demonic entity who will deceive the people appearing in human form as the final false prophet. Number two, the false prophet will mandate a global religion that will require all nations and people to worship the Antichrist. Now, in the editing, this will all be on the screen, but let me read it to you again. The false prophet will mandate a global religion that will require all nations and people to worship the Antichrist. Go right down to the next verse, Revelation 13, verse 12. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. So in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 12, we see the clear concise mission of the false prophet in its essence. The Bible tells us that this final false prophet will come to force all people living. It's global. It's not the vast majority. It's not the Middle East nations. In that final unholy trinity control, it will be all people, the Bible said, and the mission of the false prophet is to force all people living during the tribulation period. Now again, if you're a new student, by the time we get to Revelation 13, we're past the first half of the tribulation. We are now at the beginning of the second half of the tribulation. The tribulation period lasts for seven years exactly to the day not by our calendar of 365 years, but by the Hebraic calendar of 360 days. And so the tribulation period will be exactly seven times 360. And we know both from the book of Revelation and from the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament that the Antichrist is not going to be exalted to religious power until he breaks his peace treaty with Israel. And Daniel made it clear that is exactly halfway through the tribulation. 
And that's why we know by the time we get to Revelation 13, we're at that point where half of the tribulation is already gone. And the people that remain at that time, the false prophet is going to force them to worship the Antichrist. Now, I don't believe that it's a coincidence that a one world temple, hear me, and I've had teachings on this if you're a new student, uh, it's available, but I don't think it is a coincidence that in 19, or excuse me, in 2022, just a couple of years ago, that they officially opened up a one world temple in the Middle East. And it promotes and acknowledges the three major religions of the world, which would be Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And in Abu Dhabi, in the Middle East, they have constructed a one world temple giving honor to those three living in unity in the last days. I have no doubt in my mind that this is a precursor to what the book of Revelation in the 13th chapter is talking about. Number three, the false prophet will perform astounding signs and miracles. The false prophet will perform astounding signs and miracles. Where do we find that? Again, we're just walking down verse by verse. So let's go to verse 13 of chapter 13. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. Uh, the second beast, this final false prophet, uh, many believe that he is a parody of the Holy Spirit, that he's imitating and he's a cheap knockoff, trying to be like the Holy Spirit, who in the New Testament and still in the church today performs miracles in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the upper room. Tongues of fire came down and sat upon each of them, and so on. And the unholy trinity is indeed an imitation, not a divine imitation, but a deceiving imitation of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the false prophet is the imitator of the Holy Spirit. The Antichrist is the imitator of Jesus and Satan the dragon is an imitator of God who kicked him out of his original place in the heavens as an angel of beauty and worship. Number four, the false prophet will deceive the whole world. This final false prophet will have this extraordinary power of deception, like many politicians today, uh, charisma, personality and a silver tongue and telling people what they're going to receive under their administration and so on only to be led into deeper bondage and deeper debt and deeper dysfunction and so forth. The false prophet will deceive the whole world. Where do we see that? Let's go down to the next verse, Revelation 13 verse 14 and part A, the first half of the verse and with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belong to this world. And again, the words deceive, deceived, and deception are found throughout Bible passages concerning the last days and in particular with the unholy trinity. In Matthew 24, and I believe verse 4, Jesus warned us. He said, be careful lest no one deceive you. And sadly, this spirit of end time deception is not just in politics. It's not just in the lying tongues of political and global leaders. It is in the lips of those who stand in churches 
and preach from sacred desks with Bibles in their hands, twisting and perverting the truth of the Holy Bible and the Holy Church. Jesus said, beware, watch out that no one deceives you. And that Greek word for deception means to cause to roam, to roam from safety, to roam from doctrine, to roam from truth, to roam from virtue. It literally means to seduce and wander away. And that word wander is important from the original Greek because people don't fall apart and, and run away overnight. That rarely ever happens, at least not with intelligent people. It's difficult to tell, take intelligent people who have been rooted in the truth of the Bible and get them to betray that or forsake that in one single instance and have them run away. No, the deception of the last days is like a slow leak in a tire on your automobile. If you're not paying attention and you think, well, I'll just get a little air on Tuesday and you live with a tire that's leaking air, there is no good outcome to that. And so it is spiritually. Many people are living in the church and living in their relationship with God like a leaky tire and don't realize the danger of the prophesied wandering away from the foundations of biblical truth. Number five, the false prophet will commission a great statue in the likeness of the Antichrist. Where do we read that? In the second half of verse 14. Revelation 13, verse 14, part B, the second half. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Now, this is tragic. This is haunting. Uh, this is disaster on the worst of levels because now as we are approaching in Revelation 13, the second half of the tribulation, as I've taught you through the decades, the second half of the tribulation is going to be far worse than the first half of the tribulation. When the Antichrist breaks his treaty with Israel and sets himself up as God, in the Holy of Holies, referred to in the Bible as the abomination of desolation, the Bible tells us that the wrath of God will accelerate to the highest level in human history. And Jesus said, if God the Father had not shortened the days, no one would be able to survive it. And so tragically, all of those who have survived the horrors of the first half of the tribulation are not only going to be faced with an increase of wickedness and perverseness and judgment and apocalyptic events and world wars, perhaps, and probably some nuclear wars on the planet, now they're faced, on top of all of that, they are forced into a corner to make two decisions. What are the two decisions that the people in the last half of the tribulation are going to be forced to make? First, they can refuse to worship the Antichrist. They can refuse the direct command of this final false prophet requiring everybody to worship the Antichrist. But if they make that decision, they are going to be martyred and beheaded for that single decision. But the des second decision is far worse. If they refuse the mark of the beast, if they refuse to worship the Antichrist, if they ignore the, the barbarous mandate of the final false prophet and say, no, I know my soul's on the line here no matter what it costs me. I want to be on God's side. I want to make the right choice. I don't want to think about the temporary consequence. I want to put my heart upon the eternal consequence. Well, if they refuse the mark of the beast, they'll be martyred. But if they take the mark of the beast, then they face far worse the eternal wrath of God and the lake of fire 
from which there is no rehabilitation or return. Number six, the false prophet will give life to the great statue to speak, requiring the execution of all who refuse to worship. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15, the Bible said, He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. A startling technology has just caught my attention in the last 48 hours. And I'm going to have a picture placed on the screen for you to see so that you'll not think I'm exaggerating or making this up. But this startling technology they've announced will debut in January of 2025. It will be a 54 foot tall, that's more than five stories, a, 55, a 54 foot tall lifelike moving statue called the giant. And you can see it there on the screen. It also can mimic the appearance of anyone. The figure has a custom skin of video LEDs. It uses patented LED and artificial intelligence and bespoke scanning technologies. The statue's arms and hands are capable of fluid human-like movement. The giant has the ability to display any person, whether it's a celebrity or a historical figure, this cutting edge technology will bring the statue to life. And at the debut, they've already announced that those who make reservations and plan on coming to see the unveiling, that all visitors will be scanned as they enter to create an avatar of each and every visitor, which is just kind of a second level of creepy in my opinion. So when the Bible prophesied that the final false prophet was permitted to give life to this statue that he has commissioned, forcing everyone to worship it or face execution and martyrdom and being beheaded, we now have idolatry on the highest level of advanced technology that the world has ever seen. It'll no longer be like it was in the Old Testament and New Testament where people are worshiping carved images that can't speak, can't move, are not lifelike. If the final false prophet decides to make this statue to be an exact replicate of the Antichrist physically, his facial figures, his voice, his movements, his characteristics, it's frightening that that technology prophesied in Revelation 13 will be debuted in January of 2025. And we need to be ready. As a matter of fact, even as I'm sharing that, if you're not right with God, if you're backslidden, if you've allowed your relationship with Christ to be sold out to a business or the pursuit of money, or an illicit relationship, or some man, or some woman, or you're living outside of marriage, this should be chilling to anyone who is living not right with God. Number seven, the false prophet will require everyone to receive a mark on the right hand or forehead. Go down to verse 16. Revelation 13, verse 16. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. I have another picture that is on the screen of a technology, and it's just one of multiple technologies. And when I say multiple, this isn't even new technology. This has been around for quite some time. But listen to me when I tell you there are already multiple hand on skin technologies that are being used around the world for business and security and commerce. And what's notable about the picture 
is that they're actually scanning the back of the right hand. And I don't think that picture probably was set up for that to be intentional, but that is literally what the Bible says that the final false prophet is going to introduce. A means of commerce by which a mark is received on the back of the right hand or on the forehead. Lastly, number eight, the false prophet will mandate global commerce. Revelation 13, go down to the next verse, verse 17. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing the name. Imagine this demonic dictatorship in the last half of the tribulation where no one can hide, no one can escape, no one can buy, no one can sell. You have been stripped of all liberty. You have been stripped of all security. And perhaps the worst of all, you have been stripped of all free will. All of the world will be forced into the demonic dictatorship of the unholy trinity. The puppet master is the dragon, Satan. The Antichrist is the first beast. And the second beast, the subject of our Bible study today, is the final false prophet. Now, as I have said, I have no desire to incite fear or anxiety. How many times have all of my faithful students heard me say, thousands of times, Bible prophecy is not given to scare us. It is given to prepare us. And so let me close with some good news. The good news, don't miss this, is if you are a born-again Christian, if you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've repented of sin and turned from sin and turned your heart to Christ, and placed your faith in him, you will never meet the final false prophet. You will never meet the Antichrist. You will never face the extreme tribulation time under the puppet master of Satan himself. You will never face the outpouring of God's greatest wrath. You will never see on the news or in person or be destroyed by the apocalyptic judgments that are coming upon this earth. One last uh, verse I want to read to you and then we're going to pray. And that is in the third chapter of Revelation. Go down to verse 10. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere... In these last days, don't give up. In these last days, keep reading your Bible. Keep praying. Allow me a place in your heart. I oftentimes say this, and I oftentimes try to say, I want this to be wrapped in humility because I really do. But I want to be a trusted voice in your life. That's why we produce all this content. That's why I'm here every week for you. Because people need the Bible. It is your security. It is your anchor. And you need to be rooted in truth, not in a watered-down gospel, not in a perverted gospel, not in a twisted gospel, but you need to have somebody in your life that loves you enough to look you in the eyes and say, are you living ready to meet the Lord? And if you're not I'm challenging you today. Persevere. Don't give up. Give up on sin, but don't give up on Jesus. Because Revelation 10, what did it say? Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing. That's the tribulation. The great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. The promise of Jesus is to every believer who perseveres through the church age, you will be raptured 
and you will never experience a single day, a single hour, a single minute of the tribulation wrath that is coming upon this world. You'll meet Jesus Christ, but you'll never meet the Antichrist. You'll never meet the final false prophet. You will be spared from the wrath of God that will be poured out upon this ungodly world. You say, Tiff, how can I be sure? Well, why don't we just pray together? If you're listening to me right now and you're not sure as to where you stand with God, let's just pray together. The Bible said you need to do three things. The Bible said to be a born-again Christian, to be right with God, to receive Christ as Lord and Savior by faith. The first thing you have to do is you have to recognize that you're a sinner. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That includes me. It includes every person listening. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. Jesus said, unless you repent, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. I've heard false teachers in recent days, in recent years, say, nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to do anything other than trust Christ, believe in Christ. That's not true. James chapter 2 says, even the demons believe and tremble. Demons believe in Jesus, but they're not born again Christians. Jesus said, you not only have to believe, he said, unless you repent, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Repentance means turn your back on sin, turn your heart to Christ. And lastly, you have to receive Christ in childlike faith. We can do that right now. When we're done praying, will you do something that's important to me and I hope it's important to you? because you're not a random person. Everybody listening to me right now, I care about you. God cares about you. Everybody is somebody to the Lord. And your decision to serve Him, we care about. We'd like to help you follow up. There are teachings available, all free. No hook, no scam, no offering, not asking for anything but I want you to grow in your faith. I don't want you to be a baby born into the kingdom of God and then left on your own. We want to be here for you. And that's what we do at Lost Lamb Association. We exist for almost 50 years to help men and women and boys and girls receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Will you do that right now? And then make a comment when we're done. Just in the comment section, say, Tiff, I prayed that prayer. I was sincere. Whatever you feel led to write. And then go to our website. It's on the screen, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings and follow the easy prompts. Because praying today is not the end of what God's going to do with your life. It's just the beginning. Pray with me right now, wherever you're at, out loud and without fear or shame. Just say, Heavenly Father, today I recognize my sin. Today I repent of my sin. I cannot do it on my own. I need your strength to help me. But in childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus Christ. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Anchor my faith in the truth of the Holy Bible. And keep me ready for your soon coming. Thank you for your promise to spare me from this great tribulation that's coming upon the earth. And thank you for the promise of forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. May all of my family follow me and find Christ and forgiveness as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.